Hello, everyone. Uh, I welcome all on uh, Data Phoenix webinar. Uh, today, we will speak about testing and evaluating uh, AI uh, systems uh, and uh, more focus on AI uh, on LM based application. And together with us, uh, Philip uh, Tanner, a uh, co founder and CEO of DeepCheck. Checks um, and uh, we will speak about evaluation of uh, AI systems. Uh, you can ask your question using Slando. The link is under the video, and uh, I give to him microphone. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to be here. I know it took us, you know, a couple of months to book the slot, and I'm really happy to finally be here. So, uh, so uh, really excited, and it's uh, you know, it's uh. It's actually great timing on our point of view or my point of view, because uh, uh, at DeepChecks, we just released our LLM evaluation module. So I think it's great timing to talk about the problem, a bit different approaches for how to, for how to solve it. But unlike talks that I might have given, you know, a couple of months ago, then now I can like actually show something and I can say, yeah, if you want, you can kind of, you know, take a one on one thing I can show it. So I'm really happy. I think it's a great, great timing for this. So yeah, um, so the talk, we're going to talk about what we call GPT on a leash. Of course, don't worry, it's not only about the classic uh, GPT. Uh, it's about large language models and kind of, let's call it controlling them. Uh, where what we're focusing on is evaluation of these LLM-based apps and mitigating the risks. Uh, so just before we start, so a bit about me. Uh, my name is Philip Tanner. I'm a graduate of some, you know, Israeli program called the Talpiot uh, that you know, comes from the defense area that's focused on, uh, let's call it uh, technological or algorithmic leadership. Uh, background in competitive machine learning. I was very into hackathons. I like to joke that I kind of transferred from uh, machine learning to AI, although that's, you know, uh, it's a kind of a joke uh, that doesn't really work anymore because now people are using uh, AI uh, in general. And uh, yeah, the logo of DeepChecks is supposed to be here, co-founder and CEO at DeepChecks. And I'm a moderator at a community uh, called LLMOps uh, Space, where we do events that are kind of like this, but we also have all sorts of lists and so forth. It's pretty focused on everything uh, related to LLMs. Uh, and uh, a bit about DeepChecks. So we founded the company uh, about four years ago, uh, backed by some pretty amazing investors. And what we're building is something we call everything you need for continuous validation of LLMs and AI systems. Uh, we'll talk a bit about what it means, a continuous validation, but the idea is that you catch what might be an issue at all these different phases. And a lot of what we build uses our open source core. So just a bit about the components that we'll be uh, talking about. Uh, so yeah, the the... The different phases uh, that we kind of see in general in machine learning is uh, research, uh, CICD meaning deployment of the versions themselves, and production. So the idea is that for each one of these phases, we try to give some sort of offering. So this is what we've been building for quite a few years. And the open source that we re released a couple of years ago is, uh, is you know I think, what we're most well known for, which we call testing machine learning, where we started with dealing with tabular data. So we have all sorts of built-in suites uh, for testing, you know, the data, the model, anything that's, uh, you know, that's co a connection between them and try to give these kind of exhaustive lists of what might be wrong with what you're building. Uh, CICD, uh, you know, offering built on top of it, I think is really interesting. We took, we actually took uh, uh, some examples that we started getting for the community even before we went in this direction. And then we kind of, you know, um, built around, you know, for how to integrate with uh, with uh, GitHub Actions, et cetera, et cetera, for uh, just taking these tests to check if everything's okay and just running them, you know, every time there's a new version. And then there's uh, what we call production monitoring. So making sure everything's working in production. So a lot of this context uh, we had built, we had, you know, multiple offerings, let's call it before the, AI revolution. I don't know if it's right to call it the AI revolution or the LLM revolution, but let's say everything that started from the launch of uh, ChatGPT and continued with a lot of companies putting a lot of the focus there. So this already existed before, and you know something that I think is really interesting here. I think this is uh, 
you know, when we first connected and talked about having this episode is the, and, you know, from the offering that we're building on top of the NLP, uh, we had quite a lot of feedback that had to do with, uh, you know, we want to use this in the generative use case and in the case of large language models. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we had the privilege to, to be able to, to shift a lot of our focus to this. And that's kind of what we'll be more of what we'll be talking about today. There are some characteristics that are pretty special for evaluating uh, generative apps and specifically for generative text apps. So yeah, LLM applications are everywhere. And, uh, you know, you can just see the, you know, the the difference between get let's call it the exam results looking at you know the advancement between versions of course now we have already you know the the what, what you know whatever's coming after the classic uh, gpt4 but it, the 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 you know they're growing at an astonishing pace in terms of uh, quality the tasks they can do we're also seeing you know all sorts of other properties kind of uh, improving in terms of uh, uh cost latency etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but on the other hand, we have stories like this. Like, you know, I'm sure anyone that's like a heavy user of these uh, LLMs probably had some experiences like this. Like this of uh, let's call it the uh, the the chat of uh, uh, you know I want to be alive type thing where you manage to get them to say things that they're not supposed to be doing. But really, really, it's it's much broader. There are risks and everything that's related to making sure they sh they're doing what they should be doing. So this on its own is already like a scandal, right? But there were already cases where a chatbot, you know, convinced the kid to commit suicide. And, you know, I think the more organizations are going to start having them in different, uh, you know, levels of, let's call it customer facing functions and critical functions where it's part of the LM, you know, application, uh, you know, or part of the user experience regardless of that the user was looking for something directly related to LLM, but that's just like whatever, you know, the experience they're getting, then companies are going to be responsible. Like not everyone's going to be able to say, oh yeah, it's uh, it's uh, Sam Altman's fault. And uh, a lot of them will have to, you know, go to court, whatever, whatever happens, it's, it's kind of like an employee of them is doing this. So like now that we did the high level, uh, kind of description of the space. And let's, let's take a step back and talk a bit about the, the use cases. So there's a long tail of use cases, right? Not, not the use cases here are just the most common ones, but you can really see so many different things happening uh, with LLMs. The ones that we see the most common are the question answering, which is usually closely connected to the RAG use case, uh, retrieval augmented you know, generation of uh, where you're basically uh, getting external information and answering questions with it with a chat interface. There's a summarization use case, which sometimes there's a similar use case called rephrasing. There's a use case of content creation, which is, you know, someone wants to write a blog or an email or something of the sort. And, uh, you know, it could be a children's story. So they're, you know, using a lot of times some of these large language models with some adaptations and, uh, you know, uh, coding aid. We see that a lot. Uh, things that have to do with coding, creating documentation, creating tests, et cetera, et cetera. These aren't the only ones. Like an, another popular one that's not in the slide is just using it as part of the pipeline for the classification, which kind of existed before. But this is a lot of what we see. Uh, and a lot of times, even if there are companies that are doing some weird or interesting use cases, uh, a lot of times they'll have also some of these. Uh, especially if it's a larger company. So you might have a small startup that's doing like all these uh, crazy agent use cases where they're talking to each other and creating a, you know, better uh, testing kind of uh, uh, protocol uh, for the for the user. But, uh, you know, what, what's the company has, let's call it, you know, a couple of data science, you know, uh, a large group of data scientists uh, or machine learning practitioners or just, you know, software engineers that are now doing uh, this uh, prompt engineering, it's pretty rare not to have things like the question answering, uh, you know, when they do have other use cases that are LLM related. Uh, by the way, did any, any questions in the meantime before I dive in, like a bit more? No, for now, we don't have questions. All right, okay. Yeah, if okay. you have questions, you, you can ask using Slando during all 
uh, presentation. So uh, don't wait uh, for end of the presentation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, I'll try, you know, we'll definitely try to address them to reach out. You know, I know that we didn't touch yet the very interesting parts, but uh, uh, feel free. All right. So uh, let's talk a little about the challenges with, uh, with uh, these different use cases and, you know, the risk mitigation. So let's take an example of the RAG app, which we mentioned in a lot of cases, it doesn't have to be theoretically, it doesn't have to be a chat application, but that's definitely the most popular uh, you know, use case. And usually these are almost uh, identical. These are almost the exact same thing. So what do we do to get a RAG app up and running? So first of all, you map all the relevant knowledge. You know, it could be taking uh, DBs, could be getting documents together, could be creating knowledge, could be mapping out what's missing and then having someone manually do it. But the first thing is having all the knowledge in one place. And it not only can't be in, you know, employees' minds anymore, but, you know, it has to be in, uh, in something that, you know, let's call it could theoretically be done by uh, someone with manual work. And then, you know, it has to be mapped out. Uh, the next phase is what we call building a full app uh, pipeline. So getting to the point where you have something that you have uh, an, an entire pipeline that you can run, even if the results aren't yet optimal, that's usually like a good next phase. Uh, a lot of times in the LLM space, uh, people like to say that it's like, you know, very, very fast to get that POC and very slow to get from POC to production. Slow, you know, you're, you might be thinking like, how can it be slow? You know, these have only been around for like a year. So uh, whether you have time to be slow, but you know, when you combine the amount of people working on it and uh, the, you know, how, how fast things are progressing, uh, there is some sort of estimate. And I might add that this technology, the ratio between how fast it is to get that POC and then from POC to production might be like the lowest in the world. But anyway, getting to the or like the lowest of any other technology I know. But uh, let's let's just look at the, the you know this building an entire you know one pipeline to to get to the point where you get some functionality working. That's let's call it phase number you know phase number two and uh, can do it pretty quickly. Then you have everything related to improving app, app performance, which can be a pretty long cycle. You can do it again and again and again. And then there are a couple of you know issues here. How do you know how well it's performing? How do you improve it? And uh, and you might start off by like layer one of you know, does it answer the most basic questions well? And then slowly, slowly you say, okay, if you know, I'll get to the long tail of if I have you know, I don't know, ten thousand users, uh, then you know, will it give an okay answer or like a not terrible answer to the long tail of, of you know those quantities? And then the you know once you get to the point where it's ready to deploy in production, you deploy it. Of course, you know there's gradual deployments. You might uh, do all sorts of uh, you know uh, A/B testing and kind of you know slowly rolling out with all the different types of uh, uh, canary techniques, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know the next phase that you're getting through is deploying into production. So let's talk about these phases in the general context. So we'll take one example of a QA-based uh, app. So when you map the knowledge base, you might see that you have, you know, uh, the docs, the website, uh, frequently asked questions, uh, history of customer support. This, these all together can be part of the knowledge base that you're looking for for this example of a question and uh, answering app. Uh, then you have to build the app, which is implementing the RAG. You might want an external database, uh, you know, external vector database usually. Uh, you know, there are some other components that we talk about, you know, also let's say at the, LLM ops uh, space events of uh, you know things are starting that are starting to get in are also uh, graph databases which usually support ARN instead of the of Excel database but anyway there some some place where you're putting the information then you have things like the uh, you know you need either uh, something like an OpenAI SDK or you know some sort of lang chain components could be other solutions but let's just take this as an example and then we're looking at a two phase flow where at the beginning you say, let's do intent detection. Let's see, you know, what are they, you know, trying to get to? And then we say, let's find the relevant prompt uh, or go to human support according to the intent that was detected. Uh, so that's like a basic app flow that we build. And again, you can do it pretty quickly. Then you have everything that's related to improve the app, which is, you know, you might want to iterate on the prompts, uh, get feedback on them, uh, show them to, to others and learn from just the initial questions. 
you might want to compare different versions. And uh, something else which is pretty important is achieving a good version. Now, without talking about the deployment, let's take a step to talk about the achieve good version. What's a good version? Like I'm asking it as a kind of open question. It's a pretty hard question, right? Because if we talk about like what's a good uh, classification model and we have a test set, that's pretty easy. But there are all sorts of difficulties here that make it harder to, to, to say what's a good version. It's a lot more like saying what's a good piece of artwork. It's not, it's not exactly like saying what's a good piece of artwork, but there can be multiple good answers. Uh, you could have answers that you know uh, have a tone that you don't want, even though they give the right content. It could be vice versa. It could be like exactly the length you want, and the answer seems perfect, except for like one number that's wrong. There, there are like so many different ways where something can be not perfect, and it's almost like evaluating an employee, right? <laughs> Especially, you know, uh, now that we're beginning to get to the point where. Uh, where uh, let's call it uh, AI software can pass the Turing test. You know, I don't think we're there yet, but uh, looks like we will be. Then the you know it, it's really very very different than evaluating an app, which is like okay, this is the function. You just take the inputs and outputs uh, and put it in, and then I'll give you the number. So th that's a lot of what we'll be talking about here. And yeah, then and then there are uh, you know in the deployment there are some other different ways to to, to look at it and different uh, levels of autonomy. So yeah, let's take this case study and talk about the end-to-end -end considerations of kind of seeing uh, it, you know is the app good. So let's take this usage use case scenario. So we're talking about a you know generative app. Uh, in some cases, it could be an external. In some cases, it could be an internal user. Uh, user. You might have a human in the loop. The human in the loop might be in every case. It might be in some cases. It could be interactive. There, some apps have the ability to, to where you know the user keeps getting the input, and uh, you know uh, uh, you know that you can ask like a question, you reply to the you know get the answer, reply to the answer, get another one, et cetera, et cetera. In some cases, it's not like that. Uh, you might have cases with autonomous agents that can you know make multiple steps, kind of talking to each other. And then uh, you know there is some sort of some sort of uh, chaos uh, theory math going on there, and uh, there you know there you could have uh, feedback collection uh, or not, and then of course you also have aside from the user scenario you have constraints which are different, you know definitely different between different organizations or different verticals, but in some cases the constraints are also different for like different teams within the same organization, like if you're in the R and D team, or in the communications team, or you're in the uh, you know sales team, you might have completely different constraints. So sometimes you have some constraints on what has to be the base model for whatever reason. You know the your boss's boss's boss uh, bought a license to uh, cohere, right? That can happen, and then you know you're supposed to use that. Uh, and then you could have something which says no. You know we have a strategic uh, agreement with. Uh, Three companies, you can pick any one of those three, but nothing else. You can also say we only use open source models for whatever reasons. Uh, there's privacy, which is kind of related to what we talked about before that with uh, the base model. So there are all sorts of constraints of what you can or can't send. You might have privacy constraints that are related to the prompts. Uh, uh, you know, let's separate the system prompts from user prompts, right? For those of you that don't know, the system prompts are uh, like the, let's call it the repeated message. It's like the identity of the app. It's something that kind of, basically you can kind of imagine it going with every message. And then you have the user prompts, which is basically like the input, like whatever you, when you're using it as a user, write to the, to the, app, to the app. So you can, either one of those could be private, right? And then you could also have just private data within the vector database that you're working with. Uh, you know, you might have cost constraints. You might have latency constraints. Just you know, product that says if X and Y and Z takes more than uh, uh, 1.2 seconds, then you know it's not going in the product. And uh, of course, there's what's the data you have. So what's the data you have is actually I think not as critical a question uh, for generative apps as it was for uh, some of the um, let's call it classic apps or non-generative apps. I think you know a lot of times you just couldn't get to anything without the right data set. Here, I think the data set, the annotations, et cetera, um, 
they're also very important. They help you evaluate, they help you iterate on the product. Uh, but in some cases you, you, you can get further without having them than you could in the classic uh, machine learning case where you just couldn't train the model at the beginning or you get like noise or you know, very bad uh, valuation metrics uh, without it, which almost seems like random. So anyway, this is everything related to the, you know, uh, different considerations we have within all this context. And you have to talk about two issues that say, is this, you know, is this adequate or not? One of them is the risks. With risks are my exposed to things like, you know, uh, privacy, the, you know, uh, you know, bias, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have things related to performance. So performance is, uh, you know, how well is it doing? So, you know, we'll formalize it more a bit later, but these are very, very, very dependent on the context. So, you know, let's talk now about how to evaluate within the context. So basically there are a few different phases. So we start by building evaluation set. Sounds pretty easy. It's not right. Like, you know, uh, all these, uh, UCI data sets that exist, the Kaggle data sets that exist that exists, like someone built them, someone thought about them. In some cases, the splitting the data to train and test was just like a random split and it didn't really mean anything. Building high quality data sets uh, that kind of mean something um, make a big deal. Now, the evaluation set has a lot of considerations. Uh, you know, there's a question of more edge cases, less edge cases. Uh, do you want it just to be a random sample of production? What if I don't yet have production data? Uh, What's the most representative? If I have beta users, but they're kind of just playing around, does it represent or should I kind of think of it on my own? There are a lot of different ways to go with this, but in any case, building the evaluation set to make it that, you know, so that it represents what, you know, what you think you'll have later on, that's phase one. The next one is to give some sort of evaluation for each sample. So if you have, you know, 500 samples, which is let's say input and, you know, complete, you know, completion or input and response, then for each one of them, you want to have some sort of metric uh, that uh, that that you can use, and then at the end you can get to some sort of overall performance evaluation to decide is it good enough, which is the question that you know we asked before that, and we said it's not trivial. So, yes, yeah, some of the things we kind of discussed uh, just now, but let's let's go over them. Is what is representative? What's it supposed to be representative of? What if I know there is, I'm an e-commerce website? And they have different seasons. Or what if I know that I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a communications team in a large pharma company, uh, and uh, and you know, every uh, couple of weeks we're kind of changing the agenda of what we're what we're out trying, what's the narrative we're trying to tell. So there are different uh, areas, and you know, there are big questions about what's considered representative, and there's always a question of. Okay, if we have edge cases that we really care about, we don't want them to get, we don't want to get them wrong, but It'll take a while to, you know, to, to, to catch all them, et cetera, et cetera. Then do we put them into the evaluation set or we say, well, handle them separately? Because that does mean sort of oversampling. And then, you know, uh, on the next phase, the open questions is how do you compare different versions? What is the evaluation criteria? These are all kind of non-trivial questions that we've been dealing with kind of since the, let's call it the LLM revolution. <clears throat> So yeah, let's dive in at, at these parts about you know building a data set for evaluation and talk about the criteria and techniques. So uh, I actually really like this flow and uh, I think it's a pretty special kind of the way that uh, that I'll present it. Hope you resonate. Again, feel free to ask questions at any time. So at the beginning, we construct an initial data set. What does it mean initial? It, it doesn't mean that we don't care about the results here. But what it means is that we know this can change over time. But at the beginning, you want to get a number. And that's kind of what you'll start from. So there are two different ways to do this. One of them is you know, manual. We've, you know, I've seen in, uh, let's say, legal or, or uh, medical use cases where you have a, let's call it, pretty expensive specialist that ends up saying, OK, this is like the perfect summary for a long document, a long medical document or a long uh, legal document. That can be like one way for creating a manual, uh, you know, data set at the beginning, and then another one is LLM assisted, which is, you know, you could say, let's do, uh, let's generate the the initial data set because you know any way it's going to be replaced later on. You can give an LLM a lot of context, documents, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that also, you know, that gives you the initial data set. Then the next one is to, you know, constantly update it. So you 
take bad examples, you say, let's add them to the valuation set, or as we call it, the golden set. Uh, let's find edge cases. Let's think of edge cases. Let's try to ask questions that'll get the edge cases. Let's take uh, unknowns. Like let's take you know inputs that we don't really know how the LLM will behave. Uh, let's you know you could of course say let's ask the same question that we care about a lot of different times and look for the weirdest type of uh, of uh, you know outputs and then try to see you know how, how we can make them more common and then take look. there are like so many things you can do if you want to constantly update it and make a better evaluation set and then we have what we'll call the topics and characteristics uh, you know where uh, just kind of seeing I care more about some other things as time went by so. Let's change it. And the next point is to say, you know, I want to make sure I have a pipeline that's evaluating the performance uh, based on the evaluation set. And if I'm using it in practice and I care about that score, uh, these quick iterations are going to make sure that I have a good evaluation set, right? Because if I get a score that's like 60 when I think it should be 80 or vice versa, uh, I'm going to dive back into the, to the uh, data set and, you know, uh, make sure it kind of makes sense. So yeah, let's talk a bit about the criteria, you know, the evaluation criteria. So there's a question of uh, basically, is it good? And then there's another question of, is it not problematic or is it not bad? So is it good is basically task fulfillment, uh, quality, et cetera, et cetera. Is it not problematic is everything related more to risk, let's call it, than to quality. So yeah, let's talk a teeny bit about this, uh, uh, you know, this like example here. So. Imagine I ask for a recipe for a pie that has to be gluten-free, right? So task fulfillment could be the very basic things of, you know, first of all, did it make sure that all the ingredients that usually have gluten don't have it, but also can I make a pie with it? Or basically, did it look like a recipe for a pie, right? If it, it tells me a bedtime story instead, uh, then it didn't fulfill a task, right? Let's call it the connection to user intent is all related to task fulfillment. But then there are other things that are related to the quality, right? Like if the, you know, the, it just, uh, you know, the uh, grammar isn't good, or I don't know, it says uh, uh, add three sugar and it doesn't say cups or it doesn't say the units. So that's like bad quality. And then we have all the other questions related to, is it not problematic? So, you know, there are, uh, there are obviously a lot of different ways where it could be problematic, but you know, hallucinations, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, I'm guessing most of you know pretty well, there are different types of hallucinations, but let's just call it adding information that wasn't given in any place, just, you know, as kind of remnants of, uh, of, uh, of the training of the base model. And then we have the, the you know, bias problems, uh, toxicity, safety, et cetera, et cetera. And we could also have risks that are kind of less, you know, um, uh, not exactly the same style as some of the others, but you could, accidentally really sensitive details from, you know, qu queries that were asked before or, or, or you know, um, user prompts that, that came before or uh, just, uh, you know, different types of, um, uh, different types of, um, you know, sensitive uh, system prompts, uh, sensitive uh, data that ha has to do with an in-house model, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, I think what we would really want is some sort of combined criteria. So we really want to get to the point where I can at the end say, uh, is it good enough or not? So let me just kind of guide through a couple of the evaluation techniques we can look at. So one of them is saying, okay, let's look at, uh, uh, you know, either some sort of heuristics or, uh, you know, model-based uh, way to evaluate. Uh, there are quite a lot of them. You can, you know, the most basic thing is you can say, okay, I asked for a recipe. Let's see if I have at least five numbers and at least, uh, you know, uh, um, some of the, you know, different most common, uh, um, you know, it, some of the most common uh, ingredients. Like, uh, does it have, uh, you know, three out of uh, the following, which is, I don't know, oil, water, salt, whatever. And then I'm like, okay, if I got to that point, then it's probably a recipe. That's like, you know, a heuristic, of course, you could do ones that are much better than the one I, than the one I gave, but heuristics are model-based, are, they're automatic, they work for simple use cases, uh, they have downsides, obviously, but they're cheap and quick. Sometimes it can help. Then we have everything related to the LLM base. That we, and this is called the LLM as a judge in most cases. So uh, it's automatic, it's not so easy to standardize. So 
you know, it's, you know, just like LLMs are sensitive to the difference in prompts when you kind of play with them, then they're, you know, they're also sensitive in, in these cases. And there's pretty large variance in terms of, you know, what they will or won't answer. They're somewhat costly, but they do have quite a lot of advantages. And uh, I think it's, it's hard not to use them in any case. And then we have the human evaluation, which is human-based, which is, uh, you know, uh, in general, it has downsides like being inconsistent, but it's usually the best, except it's manual, slow, uh, time-consuming, and uh, expensive. And, uh, you know, if you get the wrong people to do this annotation, they just, like, quit. Uh, so all in all, for, you know, I wouldn't say just take one, kind of use it. In general, I think there's, there's really an arc here to building a good evaluation pipeline. And as we mentioned, it's in like the main, it's in the mainstream of what you need for getting an LLM app, you know, out there and working. So you can't really skip it. So let's talk about how to do methodological evaluation. Uh, so that we're, that what we want to do is achieving, uh, efficiently achieving a deep per sample understanding. That's, that's the idea, right? Cause we mentioned that's, that's a lot of what's hard. Uh, and then, you know, uh, this can be used for overall performance evaluation, iterating between versions. So if you want to compare versions, it's a lot easier once you have this kind of, let's call it milestone built, and you can do production monitoring with it. So basically, um, your life is easy. I mean, not never your entire life is easy, but some aspects of your life are much better once you get to the point where you have a deep per sample understanding. So let's talk about the properties a bit. So this is something that we, we spend a lot we spend a lot of time on the deep checks, which is the idea is we don't want to work with unstructured data. We want to work with numerical or categorical values. Um, then we just talk about characterizing the, 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 the sample. We, you know, there are a few different areas that we might be interested in properties. We might want technical properties like how long is the text uh, form, which is, you know, uh, is it using sling or not? Like there are a lot of properties that have to do with just how it's presented. And then there's things that are related to content. So yeah, is the number here correct? Or is, is this uh, sentence talking about that where uh, Napoleon Bonaparte was born, did that exist in the text before? Uh, you know, in the text that I got in, from the vector database. So, um, so things like length, grounded in context, and formality is like the one related to form. So then, yeah, we have the properties, the ideas, we want them to be able to be customizable. Uh, we, you want to be able to use them for filtering. So not only for like the final evaluation, but okay, let's look at the most toxic examples and start to investigate because that's like the way where you can deal with like complaints about the model or the app that you're delivering. And then also, you know, the holy grail is the good, bad indicators. We mentioned if you can get to it, then having good, bad indicators, let's say, you know, bottom line, am I okay with this sample or not? That's a big deal if you have it. Why such simple symbols? Uh, a big part of it is just the, the uh, you know, adherence to doing this, to actually doing this, like the discipline of the people. So there are all sorts of different ways of annotation. And uh, what we see the most common is, is this thumbs up, thumbs down, which is What's special about it is that people actually do it or they continue to do it over time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure this, you know, area will definitely evolve kind of as we grow. So something that we're spending a lot of time on at Deep Checks is everything that's related to estimated annotation. So we have the similarity, we have properties uh, that we talked about. Similarity, the idea is, we mentioned you can have multiple good answers, right? So theoretically, uh, if you have a, you know, annotated sample, which is very similar to your new sample. So you have five versions of your app and then version four is annotated. You have a thumbs up and you have an almost identical answer. You can just copy it over. So that's one way to get like an estimated uh, thumbs up. Then we have the properties, which we just talked about, but you can use them to say when something's bad, right? Like if it completely avoided the answer, but it should be giving an answer and that's, a, you know, thumbs down. And then we have the LLM assisted, which is, uh, you know, known or it's at least our variation to LLM as a judge where you're using an LLM to say, is this a good response, for, uh, you know, for this input? And, uh, you know, something that we added fairly recently is that this is customizable. So how to get to the estimated score at DeepChecks, we built it in a way 
where you can play with it and you can say, yeah, my thresholds are different, the order, the priority is different between, you know, similarity and properties, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah, something else is the manual updates, which is pretty important. You get an estimated thumbs up. You want to either say, yeah, I'm maintaining it as thumbs up or no, I actually think this is bad. So I'm going to override it and turn it to thumbs down. So uh, yeah, maybe let's call it without further ado, uh, I'll do a demo. Um, I'll be pretty quick just to, you know, leave time for questions. Uh, but I think I talked a lot about the principles. I tried not to spend like too much time just talking about how we specifically at Deep Checks work with this, but I do hope it's interesting nonetheless. So, yep, this is uh, pretty freshly launched. Uh, we did not yet show it uh, in such broad audiences, even though we quite have quite interesting and uh, cool use uh, use cases and, and companies that are working with it. So uh, just at the end, what we're trying to get to is a score like this. It actually means something, right? That's the holy grail we talked about, about the thumbs up, thumbs down. So the properties are what you see here. You can see there are properties related to the user input, properties related to the output. Uh, you can add properties. You just choose, you know, input, output, output. You can create custom properties, you know, choose from here, et cetera, et cetera you end up getting something that looks like this. And the idea is anything here, you can like dive into and see the samples. So here, whatever you dive into, you see like, uh, you know, um, the samples that are, you know, have the most extreme values of that property. And then you get to a screen like this, which enables you to, you know, sort, play with, et cetera, et cetera. So why is this cool? Because with all sorts of alerts, issues that kind of come up over there, then, I mean, let's just say, okay, I want to add things with, you know, high uh, reading ease. I get the highest values here. Um, then I get to the point where I say, you know, this is very interesting for me. I want to add some of these to my golden set. So, you know, actually I should have done that in production. So you move to here in production. Then you say, yeah, the golden set, which is a valuation set, probably needs more of these. And then you kind of added it. So this is like the basic, you know, uh, kind of idea of the properties they help with the filtering they help with characterizing specific samples and uh and they also help with the estimated annotation that we'll talk about soon then we have the whole area of like topic extraction it's pretty generic it's not special for for you don't need it to be for for a generative use case but just saying about hey what were the inputs talking about it also enables you know filtering seeing kind of what's happening and then kind of diving in. uh so let's talk a teeny bit about, about the evaluation workflow. So within here to get these thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, basically the, the, the idea is you can annotate within the system. So what's like the classic use case? The classic use case is I have five systems. I have five versions here that already existed. I just got version six and now I want to annotate it. So everything that we're doing that has to do with the estimated annotation, we meant, you know, I mentioned it's customizable. The idea is to make your life easier here while you're annotating. So there are a few different ways how we can do this annotation. I kind of mentioned them in the talk, uh, but the idea is you can use, you know, similarity, you can use the properties, you can use LLM as a judge, but you end up getting some sort of estimation which you can override. So uh, the idea is when you have a new version, then you get, a whole bunch of kind of estimated annotations. If you want to annotate them, annotate them, that's great. If you don't want, you already have some sort of score you can work with. Uh, and then you end up getting this score, which actually means something when you like you flip between the versions, you just get different numbers and you can really compare the quality. So yeah, anyway, uh, I think that kind of shows the, the, the most basic flows and how some of the principles I talked about in the talk are implemented here. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, definitely can show kind of more thoroughly to, you know, um, um, in different forums and, you know, um, but I think that's kind of enough, to, to for the, you know, for this session, and maybe we should move forward to, uh, having, uh, you know, some, uh, taking some more questions. I think Demetri, I just, uh, want to say the first time we talked, uh, uh, we didn't have the, you know, I couldn't yet demo it, right? It was still in the kind of closed beta. We would only show it in like one-on-ones kind of. And I think that's a big reason why it was worth, uh, you know, uh, the wait. And uh, and uh, yeah. we definitely also learned a lot about the techniques in the market. And uh, and uh, I also think there's more appetite from, uh, from folks that are actually working on it. Cool. 
Uh, yeah, and uh, we have for now more one question about can you uh, give some example of uh, LLM based evaluation techniques? All right, so if I'm getting this correctly, then we're talking about LLM based evaluation uh, as you know, LLM as a judge type thing, right? So, I mean, th that's kind of how I'm interpreting it. Feel free to send a correction if, it, if I understood it differently. But yeah, the LLM, or we call LLM assisted. So yeah, so first of all, it's an ongoing topic in our company for kind of uh, research exploration. There are a few different areas you can go with. Um, the, the most basic way to do LLM based is you take, usually is GPT-4 because you want higher quality uh and uh or you know one of the more advanced models and then you basically ask you know here's the uh response uh to this and this uh, uh input did it answer the question that's like the most basic way to, to deal with it now there are a million different types of hacks right because wait just like with any other use case with prompt engineering you can make that much better with splitting it to different prompts you can make it much better right like you I mean, let's just talk about the summarization use case. If you take, you know, many different chunks of the original, uh, uh, um, you know, input, and then you compare each one of them in the summary and say, did this and this appear here and here, uh, then you you might get a better answer, it might be less good. Uh, you can split it also into different things you're concerned about. You might say, okay, wait, the top five properties I care about are, you know, hallucinations, relevance, uh, uh, reading ease, et cetera, et cetera. And then you might have like a different type of LLM assisted uh, evaluation technique for each one of them. And then you might have a final LLM that kind of takes them together. Something else you can do is just voting, right? You can ask like a few different LLMs and say, how about you vote between you guys? So uh, it, there's a lot of experimentation to do and it's hard, right? Because uh, just like everything else with LLMs, also here, I mean, where do you get the data that says uh, what was actually better in terms of evaluation, right? Are you going to build like these, um, you know, levels on top of levels on top of levels of the end where someone did, you know, annotated 50 samples and then everything's trying to say, yeah, that's the holy grail and all these techniques are built on top of it. it it's complex. Sometimes there are like uh, samples that when you dive in, you say, no, I would, you know, I would label them differently. So there it's, I, I talked about like some of the options for how to use the LLM assisted techniques, uh, but we at DeepShix at least did not find it as like an easy and simple problem. A lot of times, by the way, in lectures about that, I hear like, yeah, this is the best practice. Everyone does it. It works. Um, I would love to hear from some of those people, like how, how, how they did it. Uh, from what uh, we've seen, it's a hard problem and it requires, you know, constant work and uh, there, are, there there's a lot of uh, art to it uh, together with the science. Yeah, uh, we have more one question and as I understand it's some some continuing to previous maybe. Uh, any use cases uh, you can tell about on how you improve this evaluation and uh, on what part of workflow you have focused on to improve the use case? Um, so the second part, I don't think I can answer, but yeah, I can mention like a few different types of use cases and in industries we're, we're working with. Uh, so one of them is uh, legal summarization, which is, I think a very interesting use case, uh, where, what they really, really care about at the end is that the summarization, uh, for them, at least the summarization cannot hallucinate. That's like top priority. Uh, and then, you know, the for them at least, the hallucination use case is a you know very, a big part of their evaluation. Uh, another use case which is interesting is an internet company uh, that has a classic RAG use case. So there's a demo that we like to show a lot of times. I think it's the data set that you actually saw now, which is like an uh, HR chatbot. It's, it's you can you can see it. It's uh, uh, Blendl, I think, is the name of the data set, and you can use it uh, where the idea is basically just to make sure from uh, end from an end-to-end -end kind of point of view uh, with where you get annotation that uh, that means something. So you have you know all sorts of tricks, but at the end, the what you really care about is was it a good answer, was it not a good answer? So there's uh, it, the internet company that we're working with, I think is uh, what's interesting about them is that uh, the user is not like a machine learning engineer or, uh, or a software engineer even. Uh, the user is someone that's, let's call it the properties of uh, of a product manager. 
And then the and then you know what they want is the ability to without having to dive into the code to do a lot of the actions that we talked about here in the lecture, which for me is very 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 exciting, right? Because uh, in machine learning, you know, a lot of companies I think tried to lower the barrier, and it just wasn't really there. It wasn't really possible. Uh, and you you know I don't want to say everyone needed a PhD, but uh, you really need to jump through quite a few hoops to to get involved and to make decisions. And here I think we're finally at an area, you know, with the evolution of uh, AI or machine learning, where you can use, where you know, folks that have a lot of common sense and understand the user and understand the business and understand the product can have a direct impact and aren't necessarily dependent on uh, on uh, the technical folks, even though the technical folks have full control and definitely own it at the beginning. It doesn't mean that they'll own it over time. Like, you know, yeah. in most cases, they don't want to be the ones annotating and so forth, like for, you know, two years. Uh, we have interesting uh, question about building the company. So do you think there are many um, use cases in LM evaluation to build a, build a company? I think I could read this in like a million different ways, right? Like, what, like you could have agents that like build the company for you. I'm not a big believer in that, although I think it's really cool and fun to watch, right? Uh, and you, you know, there could be building a company around, uh, you know, a little evaluation, kind of like what we're doing. Is is there enough meat or you know revenue in this or whatever? I'm not sure if that's the question, but uh, I I see this as part of the AI stack. LLM evaluation is part of what you need. I think it's a critical component, and I think our regulation definitely makes uh, uh, you know um, you know this at least somewhat more interesting from a business point of view. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, but it's not the only thing. Um, yeah. Uh, next question about, uh, uh, how do you evaluate a target models response, uh, regarding toxic base, uh, hallucination, uh, and pri uh, private, uh, data lake when scoring against, uh, the golden set. All right. I'm not sure if I got this 100% correctly. I think may, mainly we talked about the properties and we didn't talk about how they're calculated, right? There, there are different ways to do it. I don't know what, what it would mean exactly to score against the golden set, but I'll just take it to that extent how they're calculated. Each one of them, we see them as like a mini research project. Some of them are like the most basic thing in the world, right? Like if you just count the number of characters, you get the text then, right? But if you want to see how toxic it is, then you need uh, a model. So we work a lot with like bird based models. In some cases, like a pipeline that's related to them. Each one of them is separate. And by the way, uh, we don't have to own all of them. Like we try to give a pretty good out of the box experience. But then the idea is that, uh, you know, in a lot of use cases, the, the, the company or the technical folks of the company can do a better job for their use case than the generic kind of auto ML -E type properties that we calculate. And then you can add custom ones. And I think the combination is really important because if it's only custom, then it's like, okay, you know, the onboarding could take them a long time. But if they can start with something that we have out of the box and then improve it with adding customs, I think I, I think that uh, that makes a big deal. Now, we some of them, the properties need an LLM. Like uh, to, to do it well, we have to put an LLM in our pipeline, but we try to avoid using an LLM for property calculation when possible just in order to make the system more scalable. Anyone here that's working on uh, LLM-based systems knows that scaling them is uh, <laughs> you know, hard and a crappy experience if you don't need it. Uh, yeah, next question. Uh, what uh, special uh, do you find most in need of text basis AI systems? So what sphere is it? I think, you know, I'll just, there are a few different ways to look at it, which type of use cases or which type of company. Uh, I'll say the RAG use case is the most common from what I see. You know, there are a lot of different areas, but I think the, the use case of, let's call it chatbot with, uh, you know, talk to my docs, talk to my data, those types of things I think are the, the have the clearest and most immediate need, usually in customer support or customer success, but there's, um, everything, including our RAG where it's, I don't know, images that are represented as vectors and then you want to add them as part of, you know, uh, the answer. You can find anything, you know, because when so many people are using it, they don't use it for the same thing. Uh, yeah. 
Can you please share some example of issues uh, founded in an LM's model uh, using the evaluation techniques shared in this presentation? Oh my God, there are so many. There are so many because when you when the, when you when you go with a tabular use, that's what I really love about unstructured data. When you go with an unstructured, when you go with like a structured uh, tabular data set, and so you they you know you say something was an anomaly, but it didn't end up. Uh, and then there was an anomaly. You really don't know what happened there. It's just like a sample, right? But here, right away, you dive from the bottom lines to the examples. So I'll even say, if you just go over your own samples and like dive into like the top uh, uh, 10 or 20, uh, not, not even top 10, just like at the top of the table, uh, you'll usually find some funny or problematic responses. It's like, it's pretty crazy. I think, uh, just like uh, each one of you in your living rooms are probably casting these type of issues, then I think that you'll uh, you'll find the same through the system, just in a more faster, more method methodological way, and hopefully while improving the system over time. Okay, uh, if you have uh, multi uh, use cases, uh, you would need to make golden uh, set and pipeline. Do you have also a solution for managing uh, multi-use cases and reuse it info? All right, so I didn't really show this. The way it's managed within the system is that we basically have, uh, we basically have, uh, you know, different applications, right? Each application we have the different versions, which is most of what I focused on. So yeah, it's built in a way to support different, uh, different use cases. In terms of how, you know where the prompts come from, where the data set comes from, et cetera, et cetera, I think usually it's not healthy to have the same golden set. More than that, even for the same use case, I think in a healthy environment it should change over time. For the prompt sharing, I think it's uh, prompt sharing or you know just kind of managing it with you know uh, managing the differences between them, et cetera, et cetera, for similar use cases. I think there are solutions for that. Uh, like our niche isn't being like an ML flow or weights and biases type system that, you know, owns all the nuances about like the, what are the differences between the version? We'll get the version, the app version and everything together. The, the, you know, we'll get the version app and the, the, like the name of the app, the name of the version. And that's, uh, you know, pretty much closes it within the way the, the, you know, Python files are organized where it's usually Python uh, sending to these systems. Uh, then I think it's very easy to, to to just have the same you know text files etc be used for the different use cases. Uh, yeah, and more one question. I'm confused uh, how um, how the summary uh, statistics uh, can be used uh, to assist underlying risk uh, of a model. Uh, if give you a number, but uh, it give uh, you a number, but uh, what does the number unlimited mean? Okay, uh, important question, I think, and important to clarify anything I might not have clarified before that. Uh, the summary statistics you saw at the bottom, the properties, I see them as crutches. That's not the end goal. The end goal is the thumbs up, thumbs down. And then at the end, the best thumbs up and thumbs down is something where someone that you vouch for went and annotated it. That's the best. And then we try to help. So the estimated annotations are crutches for the for the person that's doing the annotation, or they're a standalone when you don't need them. Uh, and then the properties are crutches for the uh, thumbs up. So the properties can be used to, as part of the pipeline for saying what's considered a thumbs up. Uh, what I think is uh, interesting is that these crutches can be customized in the sense that uh, given the specific use case, then you can play with, okay, you know, in this case, I care much more about ABC properties. In the other case, it's not the same exact ones. Uh, and therefore, you know, two product managers in the same company could have a different way for, you know, what's thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, which I, I think is really, really important and is very, very representative of what happens with humans, right? But you have humans at a call center, uh, they're, they're, you know, they could have two different bosses that, you know, uh, reward for different types of behaviors. So uh, that's a lot of what we happen. So yeah, so the different types of risks, first of all, not everything there is risks, but everything that's risk related, yes, there should be customized work on it. And this should lead at the end to the thumbs down when the risk seems too high. The numbers are there to help.
and uh, to take over in the case where there aren't enough resources to do manual annotation. Yes. Uh, and about production, uh, does your solution track production activity as well? Yes, so important question. I didn't dive into it. We have a different tab for production, which is a very similar screen. We also have ways for sending the data out to, to, to production monitoring systems that are kind of more native, like uh, New Relic, Datadog, uh, et cetera. We didn't announce these integrations yet. We have like, uh, you know, we have them at the point where they can work with a specific use case uh, and so forth. We also have future plans to add more functionality that's designated workflow for learning from production and improving it. Yeah, and last question about the future. How you see the future of LM's technology uh, regarding all uh, acts, what's going uh, going for now, uh, European acts, uh, some legal uh, constraints. So how you see the it's really going? All right, wait, just one second. Because the last question, I'll put in a sentence about how to reach out to me uh, if it's uh, if, if anyone's interested in hearing more, learning more, uh, potentially collaborating. Uh, so uh, I'm Philip Ronell at deepchecks.com. You can see the deep checks all over my shirt, background, whatever, uh, already has the dot here. Uh, so uh, pretty easy to find me, pretty active on LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. So for anything more, feel free to reach out to me. But your question uh, that uh, you know we said would be last. So uh, yeah, I think what's interesting, both there's both the uh, AI Act and there's a Biden's executive order, which is you know very significant and it happened so quickly. I think it's amazing how there was such long conversations about the European AI Act, uh, and uh, and then all of a sudden you know something uh, quickly from the U.S. comes in and like uh, becomes uh, you know let's call it enforceable quickly. Uh, my intuition is uh, you know twofold. One of them is these regulations are really important to have them. I think they were written or the foundations for them were written at least partially for before the generative era. So some of what you'll be looking at, you'll be reading it, you'll be like, what, wait, that, that something here doesn't really make sense, right? Like a lot of what it's talking about, even though now when we say AI, we mean the generative use case. So um, my intuition is that there'll be some changes to them uh, uh, over time, but I think now it's, you know, in the past people used to talk about like, yeah, let's talk about, you know, what future regulation might come and you have to prepare. Now, I think now it's getting teeth, but I think a big part of the, the, the teeth aren't just from the regulation itself, but also just from cases that will come up in specific companies. The broader the usage, I think uh, Gartner said that 40% of enterprise application will have like a generative AI component within them by the end of 2024 which I think is pretty crazy, right? That's like in a second. I don't think it's going to happen, honestly. I think it's a bit optimistic. I think a lot of business owners would want that. But I mean, just we talked about the kid that uh, uh, committed suicide after talking to an application, you know, then the business that owns the chatbot has responsibility for it. Uh, I think those types of things are, you know, going to be just as important as the regulation. But yes, I think now it's becoming mandatory for anything that's a high risk uh, model to have monitoring, testing. It's becoming much clearer what these things need. And I think it has a very large impact on uh, on our space. And definitely, we're feeling it uh, uh, within uh, with our company. That's that's all kind of you know one point of it, which is just the technical aspect of um, companies need a solution because they're responsible and. Uh, and uh, not only because they want like the best possible experience for their customers, also that, but also because they want to be covered. That's all part of it. The next part of it is everything that's like the next phase, like not the court of law about whose responsibility is some sort of problem, but you know, is there an actual risk of like humanity being destroyed, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And there's some talk about regulation about who can train a model, uh, you know. Uh, uh, do you need, uh, you know, do you need uh, uh, some sort of limitation on who can buy GPUs, tracking places, whatever? Uh, that whole area, I think the primary discussion in that area is, uh, you know, will we have a lot of notice? Like, if you get to the point where there's something risky, will you know, like, you know, not know anything until boom, all of a sudden nuclear bombs? 
or will you know like uh, you know start to have signs and then say okay then the regular term will react. Uh, I'm assuming for most of the time the second one that 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 uh, that we'll learn more and slowly and you you know there won't be these self teaching type agents that get to something that's like uh, dangerous for humanity. I think most of the industry kind of sees it uh, uh, in the way that I see it. Uh, but I'm, of course, uh, uh, shaking before I say, yeah, I'm 100% sure I do what I'm saying. Because then, you know, if everyone, you know, dies, it's my fault. But I think the regulator will be talking about that issue as well. And not only about things like, uh, you know, privacy, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, by the way, there is a small niche within the existing regulation talking about watermarking, that AI chatbots have to say they're an AI chatbot, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really like that discussion. I would... Personally, I would leave it out of the law. I don't think it's as as interesting of some of the other riskier and more important parts of the AI regulation. Anyway, sorry if the answer is a bit long compared to the no, to the aspect. Good, was, to... Yeah, yeah. Uh, good. Thank you for your presentation today and answer for all questions. And thank you for all who was with us today. Uh, so we'll see on uh, we'll see each other on next webinar. Uh, thank you so much and hope to meet quite a lot of you folks uh, offline and uh, yeah and uh, also in the chat you can see uh, uh, they've been writing the you know the data phoenix events folks or I don't know if it's uh, just you from a different user but uh, uh, yeah the, the have a Slack channel I you know got the impression it's an amazing uh, uh, place for discussion so I think uh, you know it could be a great idea to join there and to continue what we talked about here and also what they had in the previous events uh, yeah. thank you so much for hosting me I had an amazing time yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.